right, good. Well, um, so I'm very excited to be coming back to Stanford in July, and I thought I would give you uh, a bit of an overview of the kind of activities that will be going on in my lab. Um, as Margot said, I'm going to be joint between ICME and pediatrics, and um, just wanted to say this is partly due to Margot's vision to expand ICME's ties with the School of Medicine, because I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of how computational tools can impact clinical decision making and medical practice. Um, so I'll hopefully give you a little bit of um, insight into uh, the kinds of things that, that we'll be doing. Um, so I wanted to remind everybody that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death worldwide in both men and women. Um, it, there are about um, 600,000 Americans who die each year from heart disease alone, um, and it's a huge uh, source of um, cost to the healthcare system. Um, of particular interest to my lab is congenital heart disease, which is also quite a bit more common than people think, um, affecting about one in a hundred births in the U.S. every year. And so we're going to be working closely with the Pediatric Cardiology Division of Pediatrics on some of these um, patients. Um, but I wanted to start out just giving you a visual of the kind of um, process that we go through. So um, you can imagine that a patient comes into the hospital and we'd like to get some picture of their hemodynamics. Um, and so they may come in and get imaged, for example, with CT or MRI. And then we build a patient-specific model that we've segmented from the image data directly. Um, and then we're able to run patient-specific computational fluid dynamics simulations of the blood flow um, in that patient's arteries. Um, and so this gives us a detailed picture of, um, for example, the forces acting on the vessel walls um, and how that might impact um, the physiology, things like oxygen delivery or um, remodeling of vessels um, and, and, and many other things. Um, so these tools uh, are used for a number of different um, areas. Uh, so, for example, we're interested in doing virtual surgery and treatment planning. Um, so you can think of things like uh, you'd like to personalize um, a surgery or device implantation for a specific patient. Um, we can also use this kind of platform for testing novel surgical concepts, like um, we've designed a new surgery, we're interested in knowing if it's a viable plan to put into a patient, and first we'd like to test it in a computational model. Um, we can also use these kind of simulation tools to look at fundamental mechanisms, um, for example, in um, mechanobiology, like how does the biology respond to the forces um, acting on the vessel wall. And then finally, we can, we can think of these tools as a way of augmenting the medical imaging that goes on. So for example, if you come in and get a CT scan in the hospital, they're going to get a very beautiful picture of your anatomy, but they get almost no information about the flow that's acting um, in, in the vessels, and that's valuable information that we should be taking advantage of. Um, so in terms of computational areas, there are a number of different um, sort of methodologies that my lab has been working on, and one of my goals as the advisor of this lab is to bring together people with expertise in these different areas who can work together on integrating these kind of tools, um, and then finding clinical problems where they're going to be applicable. Um, so for example, in, in the past several years, we've worked on algorithms for multi-scale modeling, like how to hook up your CFD simulation to models of the physiology. Um, we've worked quite a bit on optimization. Um, for example, if you'd like to design a surgery that's going to be optimal for a particular patient. Um, we've worked on uh, algorithms for fluid structure interaction and also for uncertainty quantification. Um, for example, to um, be able to assign a confidence level to a simulation prediction that we're making. Uh, and then more recently, we've started to work more on machine learning for image segmentation, which is a, a large part of our um, pipeline. And so these are all areas that we're interested in continuing and collaborating on with people here. 
Um, so one particular area of interest to ICME um, is optimization, and these are just a few examples of um, some optimization work that we've done, um, coupling derivative-free algorithms to um, computational fluid dynamics simulations. Um, we've also had a, a recent focus on uncertainty quantification, and this is an area that I think is going to be increasingly important um, for clinical application of these kind of tools. So, for example, um, our models incorporate large amounts of clinical data. All of those clinical data have uncertainties associated with them. The physiology of the patient is changing as they walk around um, during the day, and um, if we want to take a, our simulation and make a prediction, we need to give a clinician an associated value of confidence um, to go with that. Um, this is some recent work by um, my postdoc, Daniele, who's sitting over here, um, showing how we can um, assign confidence intervals to some of our predictions. Um, in terms of clinical applications, we're working on a number of different areas, and there are um, several collaborations that are already underway with the Stanford Hospital, um, particularly Packard Children's Hospital, that will be continuing. Um, we have a, a large project on coronary artery bypass grafts. Um, we've also worked on single ventricle patients, um, so patients who are basically born missing half of their heart and they have to undergo a number of serious um, surgeries. Um, we've worked a little bit on respiratory simulations, on um, aortic um, abnormalities um, in Kawasaki disease, and on devices um, like VADs and stents. Um, so this is a particular example in pediatrics where we've been working with um, an expert on Kawasaki disease and this is a childhood illness that actually affects the heart. Um, so a subset of patients who contract Kawasaki disease develop aneurysms in their coronary arteries. And you can see those enlargements um, in the coronary arteries um, in the models. And these aneurysms can vary greatly in geometry from one patient to another. Um, the way that the clinicians currently make decisions about these patients is they say, OK, You've come in, you've been imaged. If your aneurysm is greater than eight millimeters in diameter, we're gonna put you on this medication, um, you know, anticoagulation medication. And otherwise, we're just gonna watch you, okay? But we think that there is more information that can be gained, for example, from looking at the blood flow, the hemodynamics, wall shear stresses, residence times, and other quantities that would probably allow us to do a better job in deciding which patients should be treated and not. Um, and so this is a, an ongoing project. Um, we've also designed new surgeries. Um, so this is an example of a Y-graft surgery that we developed. Um, so we simulated, designed, optimized in the lab on the computer, and it was then translated into a surgical pilot study that was done here at Packard Children's Hospital. Um, so you can see our model of the design and then the surgeon constructing it and the first uh, implantation in a patient. Um, and this is an, another example of uh, our work in coronary bypass graft um, modeling. And so here we're interested in questions like um, how do the different types of grafts that are used in the surgery respond differently to mechanical forces? Um, so if you come in for coronary bypass graft surgery, um, they can use uh, either arterial or vein grafts um, in, in doing the bypass, and those have very different failure rates, and we'd like to understand through multi-scale modeling um, what are the biological responses to some of those um, different flow conditions. Um, and then finally, we've done some work in medical devices, and this is an area that I hope to expand on here, particularly in optimization and in um, looking at devices for, uh, specifically for pediatrics, which is an area of, of need. Um, and then finally, I wanted to uh, briefly mention our open source project. So this is a project that was started by Charlie Taylor, and we've since taken it over. Um, and we have an NSF project to support uh, the development and maintenance of this, um, of this code. Um, so this is 
a package that takes you all the way through this pipeline that I've just been talking about, and it's uh, fully open source, and it's housed here at Stanford's um, simtk.org through the Symbios Center. Um, and it's also a collaboration with um, Sean Shadden's lab at UC Berkeley, so we're excited to be moving also closer to them so we can um, continue this team effort. Um, so this software takes you from medical image data through the image segmentation and model construction process, meshing, CFD simulation, and results. Um, and this year was the first time I was able to use this software for um, education. So we used it in my class and all of the students um, were able to download it, install it on their own computer and do this whole process um, from start to finish for their class project. So this is another thing that I'm hoping to bring um, to ICME from an education point of view. Um, and there are many other future directions. I'm not going to go into to details, but um, looking at um, large scale fluid structure interaction, ventricular flow, incorporating um, other biological processes, and, and all of these are going to require um, new algorithms, new computational tools um, as we go forward. So I will. Um, leave you with this summary, and thanks very much. So now we know we're either going to die from Chakra disease or... Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> open for questions. Yeah. Yeah, so um, gathering information about patient-specific material properties is a big challenge, and it's very important. Um, we have done some work on fluid structure interaction, um, and you can use varying complexity material models for that. Um, in part, the question of how to get material properties in a patient-specific basis is an imaging question in addition to a modeling question. and um, you know, something that we hope to work on since we'll be in such close proximity to the hospital here. Um, you know, for example, you can do things like time-resolved imaging and simultaneous pressure measurements and then try to back out the material properties. You can also do inverse modeling to try to back out patient-specific material properties. <laughs> so it's interesting because surgical planning has been basically a pencil and paper kind of operation for many years. And even despite all of the fancy imaging tools that we have now, um, the imaging doesn't allow you to make predictions. And so, meaning that you can do a CT scan, but that can't be used to predict the outcome of a surgery. And so even now, you know, without these tools, surgeons are basically planning on pencil and paper. Um, so our hope is that having these kind of tools will allow people to make predictions of post-operative conditions that will then allow you to customize the surgery that's going to be done. <laughs> your own confidence that the simulation actually represents the real dynamics that are going on there? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, and there are a couple of different um, ways we've done that. So we've worked with groups who've, who have um, mock circulatory loops and in, vi you know, in vitro models. Um, that's good for validating your flow solver and for validating, you know, maybe your lump parameter model. Um, it's not good, I mean, it's not sufficient for validating the in vivo flow conditions. 
And so there you have to do things like maybe post-operative imaging. We've done a little bit of, of that, but that data is extremely hard to come by, um, particularly because there are ethical concerns. Um, animal models are another way because you can measure a lot more things in an animal um, than you can in a human. Um, we're actually, we, we just um, did our first uh, sheep study here at Stanford of a, a surgery that um, one of my students who's sitting over there uh, designed during his PhD. Um, and so that you know, allows us to measure a lot more things um, than we can in a human. But there are, there are you know, obviously issues of data acquisition and ethics that go along with that. Yeah. Any more questions? No, then thanks very much again, Alison. Thank you.